I get to do a lot of events and to be a part of many celebrations, but in my nine years as dean, this event has become one of my favorite days of the year. And so I was saying that for nerds, this is like our Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> And today is no different. Um, we're here to recognize and to honor the creative work that you do in leading your students uh, to learn history by bringing it to life in so many innovative ways. <clears throat> so today we celebrate you and we thank you for your creative risk taking in designing opportunities for your students to learn about history, to develop a love of history, and to have those lessons shaped not only to shape not only their knowledge, but also their values and their character. Acclaimed author uh, uh, David McCullough has said, history is who we are and why we are the way we are. And so our chance to look back, so as we help our students live forward, is so important. And so you help students to learn that through your investment in introducing them to historic figures, events and locations that have helped us become who we are, that that's a part of shaping their future. Today, we will be awarding 87 group and 46 individual awards for a total of nearly a quarter of a million dollars to, <laughs> to public, private, parochial, faith-based, charter, and other school types, and what an amazing difference that will make. So I'm gonna ask you, if you're a first-time award recipient, either as an individual or a group, if you will stand so we can recognize you and welcome you into... <laughs> And thank you. Now, I'm going to ask a question that I don't know the answer to, which is always dangerous. But if this is your fifth or more award, would you stand so we can see how many of you are here? <laughs> thank you. So this applause is really for some folks who conceived of this idea many years before I was in this role. Um, and today, I want to um, recognize two of them. So as we look briefly at the story of the Keeping History Alive program, I want to thank the visionary, Dr. Tom Andrews, who's with us today. Tom, would you stand? You. And we've actually asked him on this anniversary celebration to share a few remarks in a few minutes. But Tom, your powerful investment in launching this program, your significant work in cultivating donors, and your belief in the importance of keeping history alive has impacted tens of thousands of students, their schools, through a pattern of investing in resources for their teachers. Thank you. We're grateful. And we're honored to be joined today by Richard Webster, who represents the Will and Helen Webster Foundation. We're grateful, if you would stand, Richard, please. Thank you. We're grateful to you for believing in the power of history to educate broadly, shape significantly, and to make a difference in the lives of students. Your generosity is breathtaking, and we're humbled and grateful for that continued support. Thank you again. I also want to thank Nori Connor, Assistant Dean for Outreach and Engagement in the School of Education, if you'd stand. When the Keeping History Alive program moved over last summer from the university libraries to the School of Education, we thought it came home, so we were delighted. And we were really excited for the opportunity to continue to cultivate a program that directly aligns with our work in preparing educators. Nori stepped into this project and has done a marvelous job in cultivating applicants, leading a selection team to make grant decisions, administering the awards, and developing today's program. 
Later, she'll recognize her team, but I want to thank her again for this. Each of us in this room can probably point to a time when history began to grab our attention, not just for the stories we learned, although those are important, but for the values we developed. And so as somebody standing in front of you, I have to tell you the impact of history on my life. Growing up in a home, or actually I should say the homes of a US Navy chaplain father and homemaker mother, I had 22 addresses by the time I was 21, and I attended seven schools and school types, everything from a Department of Defense school to a private school to public urban schools, seven schools in 11 years. And as much as I loved school, even more I loved learning. So in addition to all the travels of moves back and forth cross country and abroad, we traveled the breadth and the width of the US to visit historic sites, museums, and notable locales. There were very few amusement parks in our family vacations growing up. <laughs> but we often joked that dad never met a roadside marker that he didn't want to read, <laughs> or a museum he didn't want to spend a day or more in. And even at his funeral, we joked that he thought it was a good plan to spend three days in the Prado Museum in Madrid with a two, a five, and an eight-year-old, OK? <laughs> Um, like all of us here, my siblings and I quickly realized that the more we learned, the more we wanted to learn, and the more we knew how much more learning occurred. And so today, at the Super Bowl of Nerds, we celebrate you and the contributions you make to your students, both now and for the future, and I encourage you to never stop learning yourselves. In a little bit, two of the recipients this year will come and share their stories just as a snapshot of how these uh, investments are making a difference. But also during this month, which is Black History Month, I wanted us to take just a moment to look and honor the contributions of Harriet Tubman. Um, her life serves as a challenge and inspiration to us all. Born into slavery in Maryland, she successfully escaped freedom north of the Mason-Dixon line, although it took several attempts to actually make it across, and she landed in Philadelphia. After those multiple abortive attempts, she would think she would stay put, but she decided it was important to return and to help others with that passage, and was really at great risk. She made the trip several times south again, to help people through the Underground Railroad to make it north of the Mason-Dixon line. And so she's known as a noble emancipator of others who were enslaved. Best known as an abolitionist, many of us also know she was active in the women's suffragette movement. And despite the many obstacles that could have kept her subjugated, she was a dreamer and a cultivator of the dreams of others. She didn't have grants, but she had herself. Harriet Tubman is quoted as saying, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. So on behalf of Azusa Pacific University and the Keeping History Alive program, I thank each of you for being a dreamer, for your strength, your patience, your passion, and I thank you for cultivating in your students the chance to reach for the stars to change the world. Let's keep history alive. Thank you. I was going to bring up several sheets of paper just to scare you. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Anita, and thank you, Nori, and Grace, and Kirsten, for the kind invitation to, to be here today and to speak. Um, it's wonderful to witness this again. Abraham Lincoln began his two-minute talk to 15,000 people with these words four score and seven years ago. As I become an octogenarian, Four score has added meaning to me. Um, <clears throat> and in a f few months, I'll be four score and three, 
almost as old as the Declaration of Independence was to Lincoln and his audience that November day on the battlefield of Gettysburg in 1863. Lincoln used that biblical expression partly because it was a more solemn way of saying 87 years ago. But he used it mostly to illustrate that 1776 was at that time beyond anyone's lifespan who had a direct memory or a direct involvement with the events surrounding the creation of the Declaration of Independence, a, a document that in Lincoln's view bonded together the concept of liberty the proposition of equality, and the practice of self-government. Lincoln had long been concerned about what might happen when eyewitnesses to these founding events no longer existed. And 1863 represented the fourth generation since 1776. And so Lincoln was inviting those in attendance who were representing that fourth generation to commit themselves to the living past of the dead. In other words, are they going to be willing to dedicate themselves to keeping history alive, rather that, than shelving it somewhere in the back of their memory bank as the dead past of the living. It's a question we face today. The last World War I veteran died in 2011, and the current generation of 16 million World War II veterans now has lost 15 million of them, and it's rapidly diminishing in the coming months and years. And so it was a question I considered just how alive is our history memory, and how alive is our historical awareness, which was on my mind when I launched of uh, this program, Keeping History Alive. <clears throat> I was then the executive director of the Historical Society of Southern California, and the year was 2004. I have to admit I had no large dreams of reaching a million or two million or now three million. That was, that, that was outside my dreaming capability. But it was certainly a modest beginning. We gave $32,000 worth of grants that first year. And when I retired from HSSC and came to Azusa, I brought the program with me. And as happened, unbeknownst to me, when I first came, it grew. And it grew from a grants of 47000 in 2008 to 306,000 in 2014. And what I witnessed in those years of interacting with you, the teachers, was how K through 12 teachers in the public, private, and parochial schools of Los Angeles County used their Keeping History Alive grants to once again make history the living past of the dead, and to make history part of the daily experience of their students, and to make students more aware of themselves as historical creatures, and to acquaint students with the underlying richness of historical texture. I observed as I visited the teachers in their classroom 
how history had become high adventure instead of dry as dust rote memorization. <clears throat> the past teachers who have been awarded K Keeping History Alive grants, as well as those of you who are here today to receive yours, have accomplished all the goals I had in mind at the beginning, and in far more exciting ways than I ever dreamed possible. The results unleashed by this grant program over the past 15 years absolutely astounds me. You and those who received their grants before you are my heroes. You are my heroes for creating life-changing experiences for your students and for yourself. And as attorney Louis Neiser once said, a good teacher's influence affects eternity. Certainly among my heroes are three foundations which to my knowledge have supported this program during the 15 years of existence. Starting with the Amundsen Foundation and the vision of Lee Walcott the Canyon City Foundation here in Azusa and the vision of its board, and the Helen and Will Webster Foundation and Richard Webster's vision, without which we would not be at three million today. So it took a village of people at APU to move this uh, program forward. And I can't take time now to name each person and identify their contribution. But I will provide Anita Hank with such a list for the School of Education's historical record keeping. And I want you to always remember, as historian Paige Smith once said, the living spirit of history while it's not indifferent to facts, it always rises splendidly above them. Thank you and have a tremendous year. Good morning. Thanks to Keeping History Alive sponsors and committee members for making this event possible. Your generous contributions of funds, time, and talent are greatly appreciated by all of us. It is because of you that teachers can create memorable lessons. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. I am humbled and honored to be here as one of your speakers today. Uh, I will not be sharing an amazing story of moving a sarcophagus down the five freeway today. And I think it might have been raining as well on top of that nor will I be sharing a lesson of water moving on irrigation wheels, but I will be simply sharing a lesson that year after year has moved the hearts of some of my students. I teach eighth grade English and social studies at Ellington, currently our only K-8 school in Azusa Unified. Every spring, my students learn about the Holocaust and its effect on millions of people around the world. Thanks to generous donations by the Keeping History Alive grant, my students, three eighth grade teachers, and chaperones are able to visit the Museum of Tolerance. This field trip allows my students to learn more about tolerance, humanity, and to become better citizens in today's world. Our unit begins with the life of Anne Frank. In this flashback, students learn about Anne's Fra Anne Frank's uh, family and how they were forced to go into hiding to spare Margot, the oldest of two daughters, in the Jewish, Jewish deportation during World War II. Students are immediately drawn to the 13-year-old narrator, Anne, who chronicles the major events that take place in the secret annex. Her diary becomes the instrument through which my students begin to gain insight 
as to the unimaginable horrors of the Holocaust. Students learn that for some people like Anne, they receive their calling in life at a young age. In spite of wars and tragic events, Anne's legacy lives on. She leaves with us an important message that says, in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. So because history cannot be changed, my students become transformed by reading about Anne's hopes and dreams, which could not be realized. Little by little, I begin to see a change in my students. They grow a little more, mature a little more, and are moved by these events. In social studies, students begin the unit by watching the series America's Story of Us, World War II. We continue the unit by completing Lesson 15, Upstanders and Bystanders During the Holocaust. According to Facing History in Ourselves, an upstander is a person who speaks or acts in support of an individual or cause, particularly one who intervenes on behalf of someone who is being attacked or bullied. A bystander, on the other hand, is a person who witnesses but is not directly affected by the actions of perpetrators. They can move others toward empathy or indifference. The articles read in this unit offer differing perspectives which allowed students to learn about the choices of individuals. Some of these were either victims, witnesses, collaborators, rescuers, or perpetrators during the Holocaust. Reading these articles helps students to make the distinction of what is clearly right and wrong, what is good and evil. Today, we so often hear the phrase, if you see something, say something. This phrase is either posted or repeated so that average citizens having the courage to make the right decisions in difficult times makes upstanders of all of us. The Keeping History Alive grant allowed us to visit the Museum of Tolerance in LA last spring. Thanks to the generous grant, we were able to experience the General Museum and the Anne Frank exhibit. My students loved viewing replicas of Anne Frank's diary, letters, pictures, artifacts, and that of which they had read. They discovered that there were different spellings and pronunciations for the members in the annex, but recognized who each person was. At the end of this exhibit, there stood a bookcase. It opened up to a 260-degree cinematic room that dramatized the life of Anne in the secret annex. For a few minutes, we were taken back to scenes from the diary. Students can hear Anne's conversations, hopes, and fears, all the while in the background, bombings can be heard close by. For those few minutes, students watch the screens closely almost motionless through it all. This experience brought some of us to tears. One can't help but think and be moved by Anne's legacy, her optimism, hope, and her heart for her family, for Jews, and for humanity. After exiting the Anne Frank exhibit, we entered the Holocaust exhibit. Here, students were able to take a photo passport card that had information of a young Jewish child. They will learn about that child's fate later in the exhibit. One of the most powerful parts of the tour was viewing the European map displayed that displayed multiple train routes leading a variety to a variety of concentration camps. At this point, students were able to enter the gates at Auschwitz, the largest of the death camps. Students had to choose to walk down two hallways, one labeled Able Persons, the other disabled persons. These hallways led to the Hall of Testimony or the replica of the gas chamber. This part of the tour leaves many of us speechless as we try to grapple to try to understand how these events could have ever taken place. At the end of the tour, many students discovered that the child on their photo passport did not survive. Very few did. We leave the museum of tolerance with a little more understanding and a little more heartbreak. But like Anne, some students are hopeful to make a little bit of a difference in what they will do, in what they will say, and the impact they will leave on others. The day after our field trip, 
Students are given time to reflect on the experiences at the museum. Many students wonder how things could have been different if this ruthless chancellor had not existed or if he had been stopped sooner. Many wondered why Jews didn't have more courage to stand up for themselves or why other countries didn't help any sooner. Some wondered how much courage they would have had if they lived during that time. Others wondered if anything like that could ever happen again. We have discussions about courage, dignity, and respect for human life. Many viewpoints were shared and personal connections began to take shape. When suddenly students want to become more respectful about listening to each other and speaking more respectfully about this topic, they become more inspired to do for one another and to give random acts of kindness. As an homage to Anne Frank, students create their own diary or memory book. Like Anne, who was very detailed in her diary, students are invited to add pictures, write journal entries of significant events in their lives. They're asked to give their journal a name and write the entries in first person and in present tense. These memory books, along with other student projects, are displayed at our open house. Parents are moved to read their students' diaries for the first time. Many students highlight memories, memorable and exciting experiences, and others openly share about some of their own struggles. Some students have come out in these journals, and others express a love for their families that they had not shared in person. Last spring, a mom was moved to tears when she read and discovered in her son's journal that he was happy to have a stepfather in his life and was looking forward to the birth of his new baby brother. This was something that had not been shared with either parent and was a very touching moment for all of us. Uh, I just wanted to share a little bit about this student. Caesar gave me permission to use his diary. And so when I asked him, uh, he says, oh, sure, Ms. Escobar, you can use it for this and any future educational things you need to use it for. <laughs> and uh, so he was very honored by that. Uh, when I assign this project, it usually takes two to three weeks to complete it, and I usually assign it uh, during spring break so that they can have time to gather their materials together. And Caesar had his done the following week. He wanted to be sure to be the first to turn it in, and, and his was very detailed. Uh, so for our open house, um, I had just said a silent prayer because we have our open house during early release days, and I only had about three or four hours to set everything up, the journals on the desks, including other projects. And so I, I was like, Lord, send me an angel to help me uh, set everything up. And so Caesar, who wasn't in my homeroom, comes in about five minutes later. Mrs. Escobar, do you need help with the, for the open house? I said, oh, actually, I do. And so he says, oh, good. I asked my mom, and she gave me permission to stay. I said, OK. He goes to his backpack, takes out a little bag. And I'm thinking, what's in the little bag? He brought out two Swifter dusters. <laughs> and so you know what that meant. I was going to have to use one of them. So. Needless to say, the open house was really nice. As a result of this unit and life-changing experience at the museum, I noticed that students smile a little more, give back to fellow classmates a little more, and were willing to let go of unimportant things a little more. In the end, that is what matters the most, that we all give a little more of ourselves because a little more from everyone can make a big difference in our community. There is, however, a little more to do for the students who remain unmoved for the ones that test our patience while testing out their own will. So we continue to do the hard work of trying to make a difference in their lives because we know how much they can have an impact in ours. So to my fellow upstanders, I say to you today, keep up the good work, keep looking up, and keep standing up. Thank you. My name is Sarah Ann Nadler, and I'm a teacher at La Salette School in the Hacienda La Puente Unified School District. Last year was my first year applying for this grant, and I was extremely excited to get it. And I came to this, this morning that we're having now, and I heard about what other teachers did, and I went home and changed everything I was going to do with the grant money. <laughs> I heard about that sarcophagus that was bought. And I said, that's it, I'm going to eBay, and I'm going to look for Civil War materials because I love teaching history, but Civil War is not my thing. 
until now. Um, I went online and I found a seller who had a shadow box that was filled with items that had been dug more than 40 or 50 years ago and assembled from various battlefields. And I purchased that shadow box. And then a few days later, I emailed him and I said, I don't suppose you have anything else that, that you have from the Civil War that I could purchase. And his answer was, well, I think somewhere maybe I have a letter from a soldier and possibly a journal. But the journal's not written by a soldier, but I'll look and see. I picked my jaw up off the floor. I emailed him back and said, please check. Let me know. And, uh-oh, there, whoop, way too fast. Um, he did. And he offered to sell the journal and the letter to me at an extremely reasonable price. I didn't know how generous he was being at the time. I know now. Um, and so the two arrived, and I started looking into the history of these and doing a little bit of research before I brought it into the classroom because I wanted my students to have a little bit of knowledge about the Civil War before I showed them these materials. So when the day finally arrived and I brought these into the classroom, the students were floored by the material. I've brought in primary sources before, but they didn't have the impact that this had. There was something about seeing the original handwriting, smelling the leather of that journal, because I walked it around the classroom, and then looking at what was said in the letter. Not only the content of the letter, which was, you know, a boy writing home to his parents, thanking them for sending him the sword and the money because he hadn't been paid, um, to the way he wrote his letters and the words that he used, the slang, the terms, the misspellings. This was a primary source unlike any other they'd ever seen, and they got into it in a way that I haven't seen them ever do with pictures of primary sources. This was real to them. And my boys who by sixth period are done for the day with history, and they're the sports team, which is why they're in my history class, sixth period, they said, can we stay? Can we start researching now? Because I told them, let's make a list of what we know from the letter. And so we made that list. Well, we knew the writer's last name, but we only knew his initials. We knew he was from Ohio only because we had the letter cover, which we call an envelope today. We knew he'd fought in a battle, but we didn't know much. So we made a list of, hey, this is what we want to know. Did he survive? How old was he? What's his name? What's his story? And of course, they waited at that point for me to give them answers. And when I told them I have none, it's, it's something we're going to have to find out, they were intrigued. And so the very next day, I took them to the computer lab. I booked it. And I admit I started them on a website where I knew they would find one little breadcrumb, because I'd had a two-week head start. <laughs> uh, but what took me two weeks to find, they found in one class period. Now, that struck terror into my heart, because how am I supposed to keep ahead of 68 eager students who know how to use the computers in a way that I don't know how to use? So I reached out to all kinds of professionals. I called the Library of Congress. I called historical societies from this guy's hometown. I called genealogical societies. And everybody stopped what they were doing to help. They were extremely generous with their time. And they started sending us materials. They started sending us uh, things like census reports, chapters from books that are out of print and out of published publishing times from 100 years ago, little excerpts. And it was like Christmas morning every time I opened my email. And my students, who are from a Title I school, were shocked at this reaction. There are people that care about what we're doing. They care about us, like we're doing something important. So that built up their self-esteem and that made them get even more excited about this project and more into this history. And I would not show them all the documents all at once. I kind of let them do some research and oh, look what we got sent today. And then oh, look at this one. And it opened up um, their eyes to how to research. The excitement in the room was tangible. My classroom was not quiet. I'm very glad an administrator didn't walk in at any point during this time because they might have thought we were going crazy. We were not. It was all on task. I was called from one end of the room to the other. I got all my Fitbit steps in those days um, because they, I just couldn't keep ahead of them. 
uh, in this way, we answered nearly all of our initial questions. We learned our soldier, William Henry Robinson, died less than a month after writing our letter. Um, we, we knew he was 20 years old. We found out he was the first soldier from his hometown to give his life in this war. But this created an entire new set of questions to ask. Um, what killed him? We knew he died of disease, but there were major diseases during the Civil War, so which one? And then we had that journal. Was that journal in any way related to that letter? So we made a new list. This is our second list of questions. What more do we, we want to know? And students continued to research. We had to move on at some point into other history but in the timeline, but we kept researching anyway. In fact, we researched through the last week of school. Um, students researched at home. They brought in things. My family, who lives five hours north, got involved in my research project because, you know, if I care about it, they're going to care about it. And my mother actually found the one and only picture we know of that exists of this soldier. William Henry Robinson, 1st Lieutenant, Company G, Tyler Guard, 7th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, part of the Rooster Regiment, called so because they crowed like roosters before they went into battle. Now, as we found information, we started putting it up in the classroom. I took a little corner of my room and set it up and thought that was going to be it, and it got full. So eventually, that little corner, come on, clicker, became the entire classroom wall, 25 feet nearly. And that wall was so like one of those CSI walls that you see that my students christened it the Civil War Investigation Wall, so it was our CWI wall. And we put up our materials, we put up everything we found, we answered our questions, we color-coded our answers. We learned that that letter and that journal were actually related. The journal was written by the boy's father two years later. That's another story in and of itself. We learned about William's war deeds. He is a forgotten hero, did some amazing things for our country in that short time he had. Um, we learned what killed him. That's all thanks to one of my students named Gabriel, who just would not give up. He didn't find the death until the last week of school, but Robinson died of typhoid. We never did get all the answers to all of our questions, but that was okay, because my students learned more about research, about working with uh, you know, others in the field, about collaborating, about how to work with professionals, more than any textbook could teach and more than I could hope to teach in any lecture or answer these questions. But they learned the humanity of history. I wasn't giving a grade for anything that they did for this project. They knew that, and they didn't care. They were doing this because they wanted to do it, because this was interesting to them, because they loved it, they enjoyed it, and that's the way learning really should be. One of my students asked me in a quiet moment of reflection if I thought that Robinson, when he wrote this letter, knew that 150 years later, students would be reading it. And I told him I was pretty sure Robinson had no idea. He was just writing a letter home to his family, and that student thought and said, yeah, it's kind of what I think, too. Do you think one day people will read anything that we do? Do you think we'll be looked at? And I said, well, I don't know. We'll have to see. Now, this changed my students' lives, but it also changed me as a teacher. I've been teaching more years than I'd care to admit to up here. I look very good for my age. And um, this inspired me so much so that a subject that I had taught, you know, I really love the Revolutionary War, the Civil War became my passion. And that summer, I went to the East Coast. And I traveled to Gettysburg. I got to see the original flag, the colors flown by the 7th Ohio. Um, but my reason for going was to thank all the people that had helped us and to place flowers on Robinson's grave. My students had planned this trip with me. They knew I was going. They chose the color of the flowers. And when I went to Ohio, I'd rented a car, drove from Gettysburg to Ohio. It was a 200-year-old cemetery record book that showed us where he was buried. He's in a vault with the rest of his family. But all veterans in that cemetery also have a marker. And it just so happened that I arrived on the anniversary of D-Day. And I was able to place my students' flowers 
on William Henry Robinson's grave. Now my students have come back. They're in high school. I've had more than half of my 68 students come back to read Robinson's story that they helped uncover. I wrote it up. They've come back to look at the pictures and talk about this experience. My sixth graders, because I also teach sixth grade, asked, are we going to have a letter too? So now I'm looking for more letters. <laughs> the Portage Historical Society, which is the historical society for the town where Robinson was, uh, published what we did in a newsletter. This was 10 days ago. So I just got that newsletter. This is the gift that keeps on giving. A descendant of the family has come to ask for a copy of this and the report. But I asked my students on the last day of school, do you think I should do this project again? Should I try to get another letter? And their answer was, well, here's their words. The activity on W.H. Robinson was very enjoyable and fun to work on. The best feeling was having everything add up and getting to see a glimpse in a random soldier's life. The time we spent looking for answers for W.H. Robinson was fun. Looking at those documents was really cool because they were sent in by actual people who helped us find out what he did and who he was. I think it was really fun to go as a class and research a soldier's life and what he did when literally no one else had researched before, and we were the first ones to discover who he was and what he did. I think that searching up an unknown soldier from the Civil War was cool and fun, but at the same time, kind of proud, too. We get to search up a person from 100 years ago by ourselves with some help, too, and it is a thing to be proud of. This has affected my students. They will never forget this experience. This has changed me. I will never forget this experience. And I could not have done this if it weren't for the Keeping History Alive grant. It was a little bit of money, but it made such an impact. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Arminda and Sarah Ann, for sharing the impact of the Keeping History Alive grant on your classroom and your profession. And one of the many benefits of providing administrative oversight of this grant is reading the final grant reports and having email and phone conversations with all of you. You have shared with our team how this grant has changed students' um, mindsets and perspectives, and even how it's been a source of encouragement and inspiration to you. And so you've heard a lot of this through Arminda and Sarah Ann's presentations, and so now it's your turn. I'd love for you to take a few minutes to share around your table. Um, there, oops, sorry. I'm battling with back here. Okay, thank you. How did the Keeping History Alive grant affect your class or teaching? And so if you would just take a few moments at your, at your tables or just group up back there, um, if you could share that, that would be great, just for a couple minutes. I love all this discussion. So in your programs, you'll see at the bottom of the order of events, this is really neat. Thank you for my group for sharing. Um, they were sharing a few things that they loved hearing the ideas that were shared up here by our teachers. And I hadn't thought of using it this way, but at the bottom, it says um, that we'd love for you to share your experience on social media using these hashtags. And thank you for your idea because somebody shared, oh my gosh, I wish I could talk to all these teachers and hear about what they're doing. And, um, and so can you use this hashtag? And you could use it on your field trips. You could use it you know, with permission if your school signs off on those waivers and all of that um, to share your experience because I think it's somebody else said at our table that they were so excited when they came here because how much it's grown and how the family has grown. And so this has really become Keeping History Alive family. And so the resources and everything, can you just share it using that social media tag beyond today and beyond? So thank you. Um, before we 
talk about the impact of keeping history alive. I want to pause a moment to um, go through a few important details, a few housekeeping items. You received a packet this morning which contained a congratulatory note, a certificate of recognition, and details on the final grant report. And so just please just take notice of that, um, that those instructions are in there. And if you could follow those instructions provided and return those grant reports to my office on or before June 15th, that would be amazing. Um, your confirmed attendance today at today's awards receptions allows us to release grant funding to you. And so um, it's a little bit different than we've done in the past, but grant funds will be distributed on February 21st through direct deposit, or there's a few people that indicated they need it um, by physical check. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to always just reach out to our team, okay? And so I also want to thank all those that made this event possible, the Helen and Will Webster Foundation for your generous support. <laughs> to Dr. Tom Andrews for your vision to provide many grants to teachers of history and social studies. Thank you. <laughs> really for creating this family, it's amazing. And Dr. Anita Hank for your leadership and vision for the School of Education. <laughs> And to the grants team, you've received a lot of emails from us, um, from Grace, Kirsten, Destiny, Ashley, and Kelly for bringing this all together today. Thank you so much. And so we have been able to hear a little bit about the personal impact of keeping history alive through Arminda and Sarah Ann and a little bit at our tables. And now we want to look through at the impact through the numbers. And so this year alone, uh, $249,221 were awarded through the generous donation of the Helen and Will Webster Foundation. This money was awarded to 139 grant recipients, representing both individual and group grants. Congratulations. <laughs> and so the grants averaged about $1,792. And so it's really an amazing thing what you teachers do with that amount of money. Um, 46 of the 139 grants you stood up earlier were first-time awardees, and now um, this portion of the grants, um, the numbers, is a really beautiful and exciting thing to me about keeping history alive, and it's the multiplied impact of the grant. And so next slide is that 537 teachers were impacted by this year's grant. And that also represents 16,848 students were impacted by these, the, these grants through field trips, site presentations, school site presentations, and classroom resources. Other numbers that display significant impact of keeping history alive are that, the next slide, that in Los Angeles County that 100, over 130, $93,000 were awarded to Title I schools. And then that represents 10,337 students. Okay. And so as we celebrate 15 years of offering these mini grants to teachers of history and social studies throughout Los Angeles County, I wanted to take a moment, um, it's also on the back of your program, but I think it's really significant to take a moment to look at the year-to-date statistics, which Dr. Andrews talked about earlier, that over $3 million has been awarded to teachers in Los Angeles County through just over 300 mini grants. And this represents over 8,100 teachers, an incredible 290,998 students impacted by this grant over 15 years. Amazing. And so as I considered the impact of the Keeping History Alive grant and 
the impact that all of you have had on your students. I couldn't help, of course, but think of the history and social studies teachers who have had an impact on my life. And so Mr. Green was one of my high school history teachers. I remember that he had his walls lined with images from apartheid. He said, as long as apartheid exists, these pictures will remain as a reminder to all of us that they can't be ignored. And he coupled that with the words from Gandhi, a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. Those images burned into my brain and those words burned into my heart in such a way that I knew I needed to do something about it. And so as a young teenager, it was during that time uh, in high school that I started writing letters to South African officials pleading with them to end apartheid. And even 30 years later, Mr. Green's influence still remains on my life that I can't just stand by. When I see these things, I need to do something. And that was all the influence of um, him being my teacher. And so Mr. Green and I are still connected through social media, the beauty of social media. And he has since retired from a long career of teaching. And I reached out to him recently. Um, I told him about all of you and the work that you do and about the Keeping History Alive grant. And I asked him about his reflections on teaching and specifically the importance of teaching history and social studies to K through 12 students. And so I just want to close our time with Mr. Green's words with all of you. Um, and what he said is, I urge these teachers not to forget the importance of the work they do. Today, especially, the need for moral clarity is particularly important. Teaching young people to think about the complex conditions and events of the past with empathy and depth is vital. Finally, I would remind these students that often they won't see their impact right away. The seeds we plant teaching skills and understanding often take time, but they grow in wonderful ways. And so thank you teachers for the hard work that you do, for all the ways that you pour into students and plant seeds. And I pray that you are encouraged and inspired and blessed this morning. And I and we thank you for keeping history alive. Congratulations. Congratulations.